Hi there, my name is Jonathan Giles and for the next 25 minutes or so we're going to be talking about modern Java API design. I work at Microsoft on the Azure SDKs for Java. We'll talk a bit about that later on. But for now, um, the main thing to know about this presentation is that we're talking about library design or application design. We're not talking about RESTful API design. So I'm sorry to burst your bubble if you were here for some um, HTTP goodness. We're going to be talking about how to build good classes and uh, methods and libraries so that we delight our end users. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me uh, at, on Twitter at Jonathan Giles, or you can email me jonathan.giles at microsoft.com. Um, I'm the principal Java architect at Microsoft for the Azure SDKs. Like I said, we'll be talking about that a bit more later on. So let's get started. So like I said, my name is Jonathan Giles. Before I worked at Microsoft on the Azure SDKs, I worked at Sun Microsystems and Oracle on the JDK. If you've got the JDK on your machine, you've got my code on there as well, which is I'm very, very proud about. Uh, but generally, my passion is developer experience. I love to make sure that I delight my end users. And that's more than just through API, it's through documentation and samples and uh, tutorials and uh, good build systems and good build tooling and, and the whole range of uh, means through which we interact with our users. Because we don't sit next to our developers when they're using our libraries. There's always this kind of interface between us, which is GitHub, it's our build system, it's our APIs, it's our API documentation. So what we're going to be talking about today is just a few small ways in which we can delight our end users. Obviously, we could talk for a lot longer if we had the time. Uh, maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll record a longer session. Uh, just very briefly, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have been recognized as a Java champion, uh, a Duke's Choice Award winner for my open source contributions, and I'm a Java One rock star. If you haven't read this book, I highly recommend everyone to go out and read it. This is the Effective Java book. It's in its third edition now. If you haven't read the third edition and you've read earlier versions, I highly recommend that you consider going out and uh, buying a copy of the third edition because it talks about Java 9 modules and all the implications of that, as well as all the new features that came in Java 9. Uh, and so what I'm talking about today is pretty much what you're going to find in that book. Uh, and the main thing to learn about what I'm talking about and what this book talks about is it's a lot of gut feeling, but it's developed over time. It's community consensus. Uh, but I encourage everyone to explore and see what feels right to them as well. So what is API design? The way I liken it, because I'm fortunate to have this graphic, is that it's like a sandpit. Imagine you're the first kid to arrive at the sandpit in the morning and it's completely level, it's flat, there's nothing to be done there. And as the first kid there, it's your job to make something fun for the other kids. So you might start building some castles and some moats and some drawbridges and whatever else that you, your imagination desires. And it's through these creations that the other kids then get to interact and you set the rules. It's very, very similar in fact to being a Dungeons and Dragons, a dungeon master as well. You're the rule maker and the others have to follow the rules that you've created. And so it is with API design. An API is what a developer uses to achieve some task. It abstracts a whole bunch of implementation that the developer doesn't need to know about so that they can work at a high level of abstraction. And it's really important to note that we're all API designers. It doesn't matter if we're writing code for our own use, just our own little hobby projects or our open source projects for commercial uh, use inside our employees, uh, employees projects or for massive projects like the JDK or the Azure SDK for Java. Uh, we're all designing API by the fact that we're writing public classes with public methods uh, and we want people to have a delightful experience using these. And so Due to the limited time, I'm not able to talk about a whole bunch of API characteristics. What I tend to talk about in longer forms of this presentation are that an API should be understandable, should be well documented, should be consistent, fit for purpose, restrained, and evolvable. And today we're going to talk about some of these topics. First of all, we're going to talk about consistency. And obviously, and, and, and it kind of goes without saying in this whole presentation, a lot of this is obvious. I'm not saying anything new but I'm, I'm hoping to reinforce what you're already thinking. So a good API should not surprise its users. If we have an API doing one thing in one place and doing completely something different in another place and it's inconsistent, our users will be confused. And that's what we want to avoid. We want our users to be able to easily intuit new API from their experiences with your old API. So how can we be consistent? There's a whole range of different ways we can be consistent, but starting at the lowest levels, if we've got API that returns types, uh, we should always be consistent. If we uh, 
have API that returns collections quite consistently, we shouldn't be returning list and collection and iterator and iterable and stream and Google Guava and Apache Commons collections and all different kinds of collections. We should identify the right types that we return in our library and use them consistently throughout our library. And obviously different use cases have different return types. So and it's totally fine to use different return types when appropriate. We shouldn't just be using them all for no apparent reason. And similarly, if we have APIs that are set to return a particular type and we document it to return, that's always going to be non-null. We should ensure that for that particular type, it is never going to be null. For example, if our API returns string all throughout its API, and we document in some places that the string will never be null, it will either be uh, an actual string or an empty string, then we should always have the string be non-null throughout our API. Because once the users start to get burnt by MPEs, or sorry, null pointer exceptions in one part of the API, they're going to null check in all places. And this is going to add noise to their code. And we can kind of remove that cognitive burden from the users by being consistent and always doing the same thing and for the same types. And so speaking of what we could return other than a null, we should consider other return type, uh, other values that we return that are non-nulls. For example, like I said, string can be an empty string. List, set, map, iterator, all those types, we can use the collections class to return collections.empty list or empty set or so on. Stream has stream.empty. Array, we can just return an empty array. And all other types, you may want to consider using the optional type that was added in JDK 8. The key point here is trying to avoid surprising the user. Another thing is method naming patterns should be planned up front. You wouldn't believe the amounts of effort that go in behind the scenes when I was at Sun and Oracle and now at Microsoft, planning names. It may seem like names are just plucked out of the air and just thrown into our APIs, but really a lot of effort goes into thinking about our names to make sure that they're the right names, that they're going to be, uh, they're going to stand the test of time, they're going to evolve appropriately, and they're going to be something that users can intuit what they mean. So for example, in the Azure SDK for Java, we use the term client as a suffix on all of our clients. And users should be uh, learning to gravitate towards client suffixed classes as kind of the front door into our API. These are the main classes and everything else is kind of supporting the client. And so what I'm basically saying is that we established a vocabulary and I encourage you to do one as well. Uh, and, and it doesn't really matter what your vocabulary is. If you want to have something like dot of, dot value of, dot to x, y, z, dot from, or if you want to use Java B naming or, or whatever kind of makes sense in your particular context. As always, the main point here is that we are consistent. We try not to change our naming patterns. And we, the main thing is that we don't want to appear like our API is designed by a team of 10 or 20 or 100 people. We want it to appear like it's been designed by one person consistently across all of our APIs. So moving on, we've just talked about return types and we talked about method naming. The next part is obviously the parameters that go into a method. We should be consistent in their ordering. If the method is overloaded, there's nothing worse as a library consumer where the ordering changes in the overloads needlessly. So if we have multiple overloads, we should always keep the the parameter orders as equal as they can be. Obviously, they're going to be different by the sheer fact that they're overloads, but where we can keep the ordering consistent, we should, uh, because nothing worse than choosing to use a, a, a greater telescoped uh, version of an overload, only to find that the ordering has changed. In some cases, that's going to result in a compile error, but not always. Sometimes the parameter types are still the same, uh, but they're flipped ordering, and all of a sudden, weird stuff happens. And one thing that we may want to consider at this point, if we start seeing our um, APIs, our parameters list growing and growing and growing, uh, there's this concept of an options type or a, an arguments type. And what that is, is a, a type that takes in the parameters that would otherwise be arguments into the app method. And you can chain these together inside the options type. So you can have an options type that has constructors for the required parameters and setter methods for each of the optional values in the options type. And if you have the setter return this, then the user can use that as a way to build up the parameters that go into the outer method. And that saves having to telescope your method over time. Now that might seem kind of esoteric and niche, but when I, where I work in the uh, RESTful API client front end uh, business, RESTful APIs have a tendency to grow and to grow quickly. 
So having an options type is a real good backstop to prevent us from having to uh, telescope and telescope and telescope as we add more parameters into our API. So the next topic I wanted to talk about was restraint. And I've got this quote from Scott Bollinger from 2018, where he just says, at this point in my career, I understand that a feature that only takes a few hours to build can create hundreds of hours of support and maintenance in the future. Just because it's easy to build does not mean you should add it to your product. Because as API designers, it's so easy to make API. You know, we can sit down right now and write, write public void, blah, 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 public void, you know, foo, public void, bears. And all of a sudden we've got three more API. It's API is cheap and easy to add, but is costly to support over the long term. And so the way I like to always frame it is that API has to pay its own way. It has to pay for the rent that it is incurring. And the reason why is uh, two main reasons, particularly there's the concern around developer overload. Have you ever seen an uh, like an autocomplete drop down list of API and just been overwhelmed by dozens and dozens and dozens of API and trying to find the needle in the haystack just gets harder and harder as we add in more methods. And also, as API grows, our maintenance burden increases. We have to write more tests, we have to uh, document more, we have to write more samples, we have to be aware that every piece of API backs us into a particular corner. And as we move forward with our API over time and we choose to evolve our API, we may find that some of these corners that we've backed ourselves into make our API less uh, flexible and therefore limiting our ability to evolve in the ways in which we would like. So like I said, every API should have justification. And as a new API designer, our instinct is always, let's make things more convenient for the user. Let's add, add, add. And the end result is that we think that we're making the user's life easier. But like I just mentioned, we're, we can oftentimes make their lives worse. And so my advice to you is to invert the desire. Rather than adding, 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 make sure that you're asking yourself and others on your team, why do we need this API? What does this API bring to the table and does it pay its own way. Having said all of that, I'm not advocating for no convenience API. Convenience API is wonderful. It saves developers a lot of time and heartache. And so we have to kind of balance the benefit versus the cost. And so something like list.of where we can build up an immutable list of items just by calling the static of method and passing in the varags is wonderful. It's one line of code that saves the developer having to write oftentimes many lines of code. Similarly, list.add saves us from having to specify an index. Can you imagine if we didn't have list.add where you pass in just the object and you had to always specify the index in which you added the object? That would just not be tolerable to most developers. So these kind of convenience APIs are very beneficial and we shouldn't frown or, or shy away from making use of these APIs where necessary. So, when it comes to restraint, the big thing is developing a gut feeling of what's, what's appropriate and what's too much. And as always, with API, we can always add more API in the next release and the next release. Once we understand how our users are using our code and where they're wanting convenience and where they are not needing convenience. So another way we can be restrained is to make use of some of the access modifiers and uh, other keywords in the Java language itself. So I'm a big fan of um, the final keyword. The final keyword is something that you can place on classes and methods and, and, and um, types, uh, sorry, and, and variables. And that means it can't be changed. It can't be subclassed or, or won't be changed later on. And so as an API designer, the way I look at final is it's a, it is our last line of defense before we can no longer control the type any longer. So if the user um, finds that the a class is final, they're not going to then go and subclass it. They just can't. They'll complain to us, but that's okay. We can be considerate and we think about whether we should take away the final modifier. But once something's shipped without the final modifier, there's no putting it back on in a non-breaking way. And obviously it goes the same with private modifiers uh, and increasing the visibility of, type, of, of uh, methods and API as appropriate. Uh, and finally, protected keyword, I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, I tend to think of it as a bit of a viral thing. If we haven't designed our, our class upfront, 
as something that's subclassable with protected really consciously, we tend to find that users want a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. So something that starts off protected might need something that was private to be made protected and then something else needs to be private needs to be made protected until you've got to a point where the, the class that you're talking about is just no longer really a, a very nice class. So uh, if you're going to use a protected keyword and you think people are going to subclass it, I highly recommend that you're the first person to subclass it and make sure it actually fits the requirements that you have. Uh, moving on slightly, whenever you build an API, there's always an implementation related to that API. And so oftentimes the implementation lives exactly and precisely underneath the API itself. So it's in the actual method of the public API, but oftentimes we extract it out into implementation classes elsewhere. And obviously these aren't intended to be public API, they're a byproduct of the API. And so you may remember in the uh, the, the Java uh, JDK, there's the uh, com.sun packages, which we, at me as a, a Sun, an Oracle employee, we always tell people don't use com.sun as implementation, it might change. Um, but people used it because it just existed and it was there. And Java doesn't have a way to really hide implementation classes uh, up until Java 9 anyway. And so the same happens in, in Azure SDK for Java. Uh, we have an implementation package and all the implementation code goes in there. And that's um, something that we have a lot of tooling around, but we make sure our Java docs don't generate it. We have tooling to ensure that anything in, a, in an implementation package isn't leaked out of our public API. Uh, we have um, various checks down spot bugs rules about it. <clears throat> and that's one way to do things. The other way to do things, obviously, and it's actually a better way, is to uh, have your implementation code as package private in the same package as your public API. When you can do that, do that. But sometimes it's the case that your implementation code needs to be used by classes in multiple packages. And when that's the case, you've got no choice but to have an implementation package. So do that if you have to but be very considerate that doesn't leak out through your public API. So like I said, we have tooling. I highly encourage you to have similar tooling. Uh, we just implement ours with our check style rules and custom rules that look for anything in an implementation package leaking out of as a return type or a parameter into any of our public types. Uh, similarly, moving past our implementation code, when you have third-party dependencies, uh, external libraries, you know, Google Guavas, Apache libraries, all those kind of thing, uh, if you leak those out through your public API, they are effectively part of your API contract. Uh, you, you should try your best not to expose them because you're beholden to their breaking change policies and they may be different than your breaking change policies. Uh, and so you should try to only expose them if you absolutely have to, if they form a critical part of your API. So it was really important when you use third-party libraries to keep them to minimum and try your very best not to leak them through your public API. If you do leak them through your public API, you may want to consider if you can wrap them in your own type and then you can change your dependency in the future if the need arises without having to impact your users at all. A new option that's coming up in newer versions of Java, it's in JEP 360, and it's a preview feature in uh, JDK 15, is the notion of sealed classes. A sealed class or a sealed interface is something that has the sealed keyword added to it, as you can see on the screen there. In this case, we have a sealed class mammal. And because it's sealed, we then list the permitted classes that can implement or extend from this mammal type. So in this case, we're saying dog and cat are the only types in the entire world that can extend from mammal. Now, there's a few restrictions with this. Uh, first of all, the seal type and the uh, permitted types must be in the same module. Uh, all permitted types must be direct descendants of the sealed type. And then there's a few rules around um, the modifier that's required on the permitted types. Either you have to use the final modifier on the, the, in this case, the dog and the cat. So that means that they can't be subclassed any further. You can use the sealed modifier with its own list of permitted keywords, or you can say non-sealed, which basically reverts the dog and the cat back to being subclassable by all types. So sealed classes may be a little bit niche, but for API designers, they're gonna be extremely useful. So it goes without saying, but we have to have developer empathy. We have to be the first people to eat our own dog food. Uh, 
we have to see the problem domain from the user's eyes. It's way too easy to write libraries up in your ivory tower and never actually understand how the libraries are to be used. And when we do that, we do our users a huge disservice. And I highly recommend you being the first person to write sample code that uses your API and discuss that code with real world users. And the nice thing about it is once you start writing sample code, uh, you can identify unclear intentions uh, duplicate or redundant APIs or um, abstraction being too high level or too low level. And as well, once you've written the sample code, it's great stuff to document and pass on to actual users further down the track. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about is documentation. I'm a huge fan of writing high quality Javadoc. I love seeing the common annotations that people use in Javadoc for at C, at since, at link, and so on. And I love seeing uh, code snippets. If you're writing Javadoc and you put code snippets in, I, I applaud you, I love that. Uh, and I always love pointing people to Javadoc as the first reference point if I get a bug report or an issue. And if I can't point them to Javadoc, I have to ask myself, well, why, did, why can't I point them to the Javadoc? Why didn't I write about this? And am I gonna write something about it now? So here's an example of what I'd love to see. This is uh, some Javadoc I wrote a few years ago now. Uh, it's a page full of text. It explains things really clearly. It gives some sample code. The other nice thing about Javadoc is it's a great way to review your API because it's very honest. You're going to see if something's leaking out, uh, whether it be implementation or mistaken API that you thought was supposed to be private but isn't. Uh, uh, you can look for missing Javadoc itself uh, and just things that don't feel right. Does something just not feel right? It gives you a different view from your IDE because your IDE is overloaded with a lot of code. Javadoc is just the API. So get into the habit of generating your API as often as you possibly can and reviewing it. One tip from my own experience when I was working on the JDK is do not write negative examples in your code. And that's something like saying, here are some code you should never write. Because now we live in the Stack Overflow world where people look for a code snippet and they copy and paste it and then they go on with their job. The problem is when you do that, the people see the negative code and they don't read any further. And in my experience, my unfortunate experience, a lot of your next uh, releases bug reports are going to be based on people copying and pasting that code. So here's an example I wrote a few years ago in the JDK for JavaFX. I wrote a warning about inserting nodes into the combo box items list. This is strongly not recommended. For example, rather than use the following code, you should do the following. And I got so many bug reports about those five lines that you shouldn't do because no one bothered to do the many lines that you should do. So a slight deviation now. We are all writing Java code. I challenge everyone watching this presentation to try to follow this baseline challenge. We are stuck on Java 8, and we've been stuck on Java 8 for a very long time. Java 11 is long-term support. It's been out since 2018, and I challenge you all to go out, identify the code that you're writing, uh, the libraries that you're using, the deployments that you're uh, working on. Can you move beyond Java 8? If you can, please do. Be that change agent inside your organization to move beyond Java 8. If you can't, file bug reports, get involved and get over that hurdle as much as you can. Because for people like me who are writing libraries day in, day out, we have to remain stuck on Java 8 for now because that's where so many people still are. One day though, we're going to say no more. We're going to say the new baseline is 11 or 17 or whichever version we choose to baseline. And at that point, if you're still stuck on Java 8, you're going to find it tougher and tougher to remain there. Please move forward and please help the community get over the hurdle of Java 9 modules. So in short, our goal is to get everyone moving in the same direction. We want to delight our users by having a really great user experience with our APIs and our samples and our documentation and everything around our libraries. I can only talk about a little bit of that today, but there's so much more to think about. Put yourself in the shoes of your end user and ask the question, what more do they need to be really delighted to buy this library? Uh, but in conclusion, there is no magical process to API design. It's one of those things that uh, as we practice it, like art, it becomes easier and easier. And so I encourage you just work with people that you like in your organization or in your open source project and ask them what is good about the API that you've just designed? What is bad? How can it be improved? And over time, develop your gut sense.
So I just wanted to round out with a few useful links. Uh, I would be remiss in not discussing what I work on, which is the Azure SDK for Java. That's a set of libraries targeting all of the Azure services, uh, focus on really high quality API design, but alongside that, uh, Javadoc, uh, um, samples, tutorials, uh, everything. And so what I've talked about today is basically what I live and breathe at Microsoft. If you're wanting to use Azure, go to that link, get started without Azure SDK for Java. And if you need a little uh, gentle prodding, we have the free Azure account. You can get a whole bunch of credit, 12 months free access to a bunch of stuff uh, and a bunch of stuff that's also just free forever. I've given this talk many times in the past. If you want to see the longer form of these presentations or written forms of these presentations, uh, aka.ms Java API design is where you can go. Having uh, mentioned written forms, a, a while back I wrote a, um, a ref card on DZone. It's a really nicely formatted PDF document. It's a dozen or so pages. I highly recommend if you feel like reading this presentation that you go and download this ref card. And so with that, thank you for your time and all the best.